Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome, Welcome to Community, Community Baptist, Baptist Church. Church. And, uh, I'm going to I'm going to be Anthony Warden today, today, and uh, it is good to see each and every one of you here. And uh, thank you so much for uh, coming and, and worshiping with us. And uh, we're looking forward uh, to today. I want to begin by saying we. Um, we actually had our fish fry last night uh, to raise funds to help medical bills for Brooke Williams, who was hit by a car while fixing a fence uh, when she was on her four-wheeler. And uh, she was here for some time, and she had an event that she had to be at um, since we changed the date. But um, as a result of the giving and all, after expenses, we were able to give her a check for $2,000. And so I want to give you a round of applause for that. Thank you so much. Every, every little, little bit helps, helps and those, those who have been in that situation, that situation you know that uh, uh, everything, everything helps. helps. But I want to personally thank you. And, and so, so I did I laugh. laugh. I told my wife, I said, I don't know what I was thinking. I said, you know, I know we're Baptists, but we got the fish fry um, last night. We've got our Thanksgiving meal Tuesday night. And then we got the movie night with another meal uh, this coming Sunday. And so you're really going to get taken care of if you want to come eat at Community Baptist Church this, this week. And so... Um, and I know that over Thanksgiving, we don't eat anything, so uh, it's just going to work out great. But uh, I do have a few announcements, and this evening, we're going to have our nominating uh, committee selection. Basically, uh, it, it, you'll get nominated, and you'll come into, uh, you can uh, say yes to that or no to that. That's just to approve officers and teachers. That's all it is. Uh, really simple process, and so we'll have that tonight. Um, and speaking of this week, starting uh, Tuesday at 6.30, we're going to have a service in here. And, um, and then from, for about 30 minutes, and then we'll have some music, and then we'll have a, a short message. I promise it'll be a short message, but uh, give, a, give us something a little bit special. We always try to do something there. And then we'll have our meal in here at 7 p.m. And so we're asking uh, our members, if you can bring a dessert or a vegetable, uh, just to have it here uh, by 630, by the time the service starts. That way, the ladies that are preparing all this and the gentlemen, that they can get all of that set up over there. We'd love to have you. Please come. If you are uh, under the sound of my voice this morning, uh, we, we want you to come and join us for Tuesday evening. It's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an awesome experience, a, a great time of praise and uh, being thankful and just coming together as community and then uh, sharing that meal together in in. in in fact, um, we're going to set up the tables for that this evening. Um, <coughs> I have a diagram, and uh, there's a team that is going to help with that. But if you're able to help come and help set up tables right after the evening service, because we have the kids program in here tonight, and so if you can help set up tables, and also we're going to throw some decorations on the table. Uh, you know, uh, teamwork makes what? Dream work, that's exactly right. Teamwork makes dream work. So uh, if you are able to help tonight, we'd appreciate that very much. And so uh, the church, church will provide the turkeys and we'll provide the ham. And then we're just asking you guys to bring any vegetables or desserts. The God's creation calendars are in and they are in the foyer. If you signed up for those, uh, your name should be on those. Make sure you give that check to Pat. They're $7 a piece. I think if I'm right, we have about... Uh, eight left that were not spoken for, and so you can see Pat about that. Do what? All right. The sa the sound person's taking care of that. You may need to get me a handheld in case it's this particular mic. Can I have a handheld? One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Testing. <laughs> Testing, one, two, one, two. Testing. All right. I, I didn't know which way it was on. Is that better? All right. That's no problem. Um, and so... Uh, so whatever, I hope you heard all of that, but we do have God's creation calendars. Can you hear me now? All right, good deal. 
And then um, we have uh, sign-up sheets for those who want labels. Um, and we'll, you, we do Christmas cards every year. For those who would like to do that, there'll be uh, the, the, the card slots, the mailboxes will be out in the, in the hall. And you'll be able to help with that. Also, uh, this coming Sunday night, we're going to have our movie night. We have a, um, every quarter we have a family uh, function and uh, so we're going to show miracles from heaven it's based upon a true story a very very good movie so we'll start our dinner at five o'clock that will simply just be a hot dog dinner with some chips and then we'll have for the movie we'll have your uh, your popcorn and your candy and stuff but bring a friend it'll be a great time uh, especially for people who have gone through some very hard times in their life to show that God is right there with them and walk in this journey uh, the whole time. And uh, then also don't forget we're, uh, we're going on our annual beach trip and then that Sunday morning we will have our service on the beach but Pastor Ricky will be preaching on that Sunday morning for those who are staying here for that that and then we're going to have our missionary Limo Paku will be with us on that Sunday night and uh, uh, Amanda O'Connor has asked that if you would like to do an old-fashioned Christmas caroling uh, we're going to do that on December 5th we're going to have a potluck meal here we're eating again at 545 and uh, and so if you would like to do that there is a sign-up sheet out there we're going to we're going to visit some of our shut-ins and be able to do an old-fashioned Christmas carol caroling um, and also December 10th, we have a memorial service that we started, I don't know, four or five years ago maybe. And, uh, and so if you have a loved one that's passed away, we really want you to put their name and the date that they passed. And uh, we're going to honor them. We, we have uh, the, the luminaries that we'll put on stage, and we would really like to honor them uh, this, this year. Your family, you don't have to be a member here. You can invite one of your friends if they have lost someone. Uh, we're, we're not going to embarrass them. We're just going to ask them to stand up when, the, when their family's name is called. And so uh, we, we like to do that just to honor those who have uh, passed this year. Um, and don't forget, well, uh, December 13th, we're going to have our community breakfast. And that morning, there's going to be a, like a Christmas sing-along. Uh, and there's a couple people that's going to help with that. Um, Carolyn um, has asked if we would uh, let all those who are involved in youth and the, uh, youth and adults who are involved in the Christmas play, you know who you are. That's November the 19th from 515 to 545, November 19th, and then again in December Third, and that's 4 to 7 p.m. There is choir practice tonight at 4.30. For those who sing in the choir, there is choir practice, okay? All right. And also, uh, there was one name that was accidentally left off the list last week for the veterans, and that was Avery Osborne, and, and so he is in the bulletin now. Um, I do have your gift cards uh, for those who, um, so you'll need to see me. If you were signed up last week, you're a veteran, I have your gift cards for that. All right. Um, there are some prayer requests that I'm going to go through, and then I'm going to pray and, and turn it over to Robbie. But um, we're going to continue to pray for the Bradshaw, Ethan Bradshaw family. Ethan did pass away, the 12-year-old that was in Anthony's school. And so uh, continue to pray for this family. And Caroline Elaine uh, has a, uh, the baby. There's a baby that has open-heart surgery on Wednesday of this week. And um, also uh, Carson Miner, he is a 22-year-old. Uh, some of you, he's, some of you know his family or know him. Uh, he had a motorcycle accident, and uh, he is, he is, uh, I guess clinically, there's no brain activity. Uh, and this past week, uh, he had a stroke on the good side of his brain. And so, uh, unless God intervenes and there's a miracle, um, and so we're going to just need to pray for this family, the Miner family. Um, and my wife is sick this morning, along with her mom and dad. Bob and Pat's been sick for about eight days now, and uh, my, my wife has gotten sick. And then John Ryan also is sick. There is some type of bug or something going around, and so we need to continue to pray uh, for these folks. <clears throat> well, I'm going to be quiet and sit down and let you guys sing, and so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you today, and we thank you for your goodness to us and your mercy that endureth forever. And Lord, we're thankful that you have been able to reveal your, your will to us this week in our lives through your word, through the interaction with your Holy Spirit. And God, we thank you for the blessings that you have given us. Now, Lord, also we see that 
we have so much to be thankful for that we're not just thankful for this time of year or during this time of year, but as we look around and we see how much you have taken care of us, but we are thankful for your grace and your mercy. I'm thankful for that this is not all there is in the world, but there is a whole eternity still left. But Lord, we pray for this young man who's been on a motorcycle accident, Mr. Minor and Carson Minor, and I, I pray for his family and what his family's going through as they're just going through this mourning and this tragedy for this Ethan Bradshaw family who this young boy has passed away, for this young baby that is getting ready to have open heart surgery, and for those who are battling the sicknesses and the cancers and the illness. Lord, we just ask that you would continue to let us put our faith and trust in you, and we just hope and into what you're going to do and put our faith in that. Lord, thank you for this morning and for being able to open up your word, for being able to sing. Thank you for these young people that are wanting to sing to you. Lord, thank you for what you are going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see everybody this morning. That's a good-looking crowd, I'll tell you what. And you know why it is? Because I'm up here. <laughs> but it's great seeing you all this morning. And we got just a little bit of business to take care of before we, you know, I just realized that I shut my song, so I don't know what page I'm on. <laughs> um, we got a little bit of business to take care of before we, um, before we sing. So uh, Chris only thought he was getting away. So Chris, if you would come up here. And if Holly and Ricky would come up here. As everybody uh, knows, uh, last month was Pastor Appreciation Month. And, uh, and as Chris has uh, elaborated to so many times that uh, the scripture bears out that, you know, we have the ability to do something good so we should do it, um, and that's a, a testament to everybody, but I'm, uh, I can speak for myself, and I think about everybody here that these folks right here are second to none, are second to none. Uh, in a season of Thanksgiving, we as a congregation can say we are truly blessed to have Pastor Chris and Pastor Ricky and their wives here to serve alongside with. So let's give them a huge a round of applause. Awesome, awesome. So Chris, this is for Christy. I mean, <laughs> and Ricky, this is for Holly. <laughs> and again, just words, we don't have enough words to tell you guys uh, just how much we appreciate the, the, the tireless hours that you put in to, to, to serving the Lord, and we really do appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right, now we're going to have a fellowship song, and I hope at least half of you know this song, so you can beat me up later if you don't. But let's all stand together. We're going to sing the first two verses of Come Ye Thankful People Come, have a time of fellowship, and come back and sing the third verse. Come ye thankful people come, raise the song. I'm 
fellowship. should know this song, so I want to hear everybody really sing out, but uh, you know, it doesn't matter what, if we're in good times in our life and bad times in our life, uh, it's Jesus who sustains us, and by Him all things are held together, so when you feel like your world's falling apart, just look up, He's there, you know, truly blessed is His name, so everybody let's sing.
At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess to the glory of God the Father, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus.
Very good. Thank you. What a blessing. That's good. As you have been here for the last couple of weeks, is it, is it better? I think we're going to try something. It's good now? Okay. And so we had started talking about a new series called Hashtag Blessed and what that looks like. And in this series, we have discussed that what hashtag really means, hashtag blessed, it means true happiness is, is what it means. And we're in Matthew chapter 5, and this is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. As Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, he's talking to the Sadducees, but remember, he's talking to us. And we looked at the fact of what happiness really is through Matthew 5, 3 through 11. We said that happiness is the condition of the soul. So some people would not view happiness like this. Some people would view happiness if your lunch is good and your service is good today at the restaurant, then you'll be happy. When you didn't have to complain, complain to the manager, somebody said, well, happiness for me is if I get my Sunday afternoon nap, then I'll be happy. And so we see here that happiness is defined as simply the condition of the soul. So if you have a great lunch or you don't have a great lunch, guess what? That doesn't define if, if I'm happy or not. The test results that come back, whatever they may be, doesn't determine if I'm truly blessed or not. It is a condition of, which, of, condition of bliss. And it has nothing to do with your external circumstances, does it? And so... My condition of my soul is solely, is, is solely based, totally different than what the world defines as blessed. There's families that are going through a very horrific time right now in our, in our neighborhood. And, and families that know those families and they're, they're hurting for them. But honestly, this doesn't determine my happiness. Because if you look at happiness and you're on this emotional roller coaster where you're going to find yourself, I'm happy that I'm sad, I'm happy and I'm sad, I'm happy and I'm sad. And after a while, you're wore out and you wear out the people around you, honestly. And so we see that the steps of true happiness is, first of all, the attitude of the believer. Last week, we looked at what it means to be poor in spirit. Poor in spirit. We said that the word poor in spirit means beggar. And this is not somebody who is just sitting on the side of the road and he can make it several days, but he is literally begging for every single meal that he has or she is. That's what poor in spirit, that you come to the realization that you are in total desperate need of Jesus and him alone for your salvation. You and I have nothing to bring to the table. I said the word poor here doesn't, it means truly poor. I have nothing. I do not have a dime to my name. I am totally dependent on somebody else. And so I ask you this question, how are you going to make it into heaven? And if you have any other answer other than but through the blood, shed blood of Jesus Christ. If you have any other answer than that, then it's wrong. It is by grace that you are saved through what? Faith. And not of yourselves. Why? Because you and I are completely, truly poor. Poor. I have nothing to offer to God. You can't look at your works. You can't look at anything you have. You can't look that you gave at the fish fry or that you were here this morning. None of that. Get you into heaven because you have nothing to offer. You're totally dependent upon Christ. So that's your answer. And you have to put your faith and your trust in him and his finished work on the cross. So that's the attitude. You want to be happy? 
He said, first of all, you must understand that you're truly poor. All of a sudden, we have blown the definition of what the world's happiness is is completely out of the water. This is why the world is never really happy, because they're doing this all the time. And so today we're going to say, those who are poor in spirit, we're going to see the attitude is going to be an attitude of mourning. I've never heard anybody say, oh, I'm really happy because I'm in mourning. But we're going to see that's what Jesus defines as happiness. And then we're going to look the next time is on meekness. And, and then for those who are meekness, and then hunger and thirst after righteousness. And then we're going to see the results of those attitudes is then we're going to receive mercy and purity and peacemaking. And then the reaction to the world is not necessarily going to be great, by the way. And we're going to see the persecution and the false accusation. But we're starting in Matthew chapter 5, 4. And we said... Here we are, Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And we're going to see what the definition of mourning looks like today and what Jesus' definition is. And I want to get you focused in on how this definition applies. Because the truth is, there are nine different Greek words that describe the word mourning or sadness. And they're all at different levels. Nine different Greek words. And so what we'll see here is that sorrow is a gift from God. Have you ever thought about sorrow being a gift from God? Do you believe that grieving is a gift from God? Mourning is a gift from God? So, for instance, some of you just came through surgery. Sorrow is a like pain after a surgery. Sorrow is an emotion. It's a pain that we're battling with. It's like getting out of surgery, and you know when you get out of surgery, you're going to sustain pain, right? You're going to. Why? Well, they're cutting on muscles and tendons and, and whatever. But that's not the real reason we're going through pain. God designed pain after surgery so that we don't overextend ourselves, so we don't overextend our body. It prevents further injury. Could you imagine if you come out of surgery and you did not feel any pain and you were like, you know what, I just broke my femur. I think I'm going to go for a run. Could you imagine the damage that you do to your leg? It's kind of like a leper. When the leper loses his ability to have, he loses his nerve damage. And, you know, after a while they can stand on a, a coal hot coals, and they can stand there because of the nerve damage. They can't feel anything, and that's why they end up losing the use of their feet and their hands. If God didn't allow you to go through pain, then you would damage yourself even further. So here is what I know to be true about why mourning and sorrow is a gift. If I don't grieve and I don't mourn and I don't sorrow, then guess what? I start bottling this stuff up, and some of you live that way bottling our hurts and our mourning up is poison to our body some of you are yet to still grieve certain death and things that's happened in your life and as a result something has happened in your soul and you are resentful or you may be bitter you may be angry whatever it may be but some of you have bottled stuff up in your life because you refuse to grieve and mourn now, I know this is not in context what he's saying, but I'm going to get to that. But I'm just throwing this out as extra. That when every time you go through something in your life, you have to grieve. You can't just, as the old saying, just pull your pants up and move forward or whatever. Lace your boots up and be a man, be a woman. You have to go through grieving. You have to go through mourning. And that, doesn't, that, that takes time, doesn't it? That's not something that a week later, it drives me crazy to hear the things that people say when somebody loses a loved one three months later. They were like, you haven't moved on from that yet? Six months later, aren't you ready to move on? Aren't you ready to get rid of their stuff? Aren't you ready? Would you leave them alone? Everybody doesn't mourn and grieve loss or hurt the same way. Just because you did it a certain way. By the way, you may have not done it right. 
But just because you did it a certain way doesn't mean somebody else, everybody else does it the same way. And simply because of this, your relationship with your mom or your dad or your spouse or your kid or whatever it may have been totally different than what their relationship is. And you got to look at the circumstance. Maybe somebody loses somebody tragically really quick, and, but, but maybe you sat by the bed of your loved one for four years and you watched them slowly. You had your time to grieve and to mourn. Everybody is different. But I want to tell you what, grieving, grieving and mourning is a gift from God. It is painful. It's something we have to go through. The, people, the, the reason people resist it is because it involves pain. That's why people don't want to have surgery. They know they're going to go through the pain. But it involves pain. But pain is a part of healing. It is. And so, as we see what sorrow does, there's proper types of sorrow and loneliness in the Bible. In this same word, but it says Abraham cried when his wife died. And some of you have experienced the loss of a spouse and We're going to see further what this word looks like. Paul cried when he felt defeat. And the sorrow and the mourning of defeat. These are proper types of mourning and proper types of sorrow. By the way, I talked about there was like nine different mournings and sorrows in the Bible. How about Jeremiah? Do you remember when Jeremiah knew that that judgment was coming? And he did what? He wept. He wept. We saw Ezra weeping when he saw that the people had intermingled in their inner, inner relationships with the pagan uh, people. And he wept because he was mourning. He was sorrowful. How about the father who was, had a son, a child who was demon-possessed, and he was brokenhearted, sorrowful for his child. And he cried out to Jesus. However, however, there are some improper types of mourning. We see that Amnon, how nasty this is, was lusting after his sister, right? And he was sorrowful because he could not have her. That's, a, that's another terminology for sorrow or mourning in the Bible. There's another type when your material lust can't be fulfilled. Not only your physical lust, but your material love, lust can't be fulfilled. Remember Ahab wanted Naboth's vineyard and ended up killing him for it because he wanted to fulfill that lust. And he was sorrowful and mourning that he wasn't able to fulfill this. So what I'm trying to paint a picture is there's different types of sorrows. There's different types of mourning. And then we're going to get into the fact of what is in the world is Jesus talking about here. What is the mourning when he says, and, and the blessed are those who mourn. It's called pentheo. Pentheo. Pentheo is to mourn or lament for. This is an example. And many of us have seen this. Here's a man. Here's a woman at a funeral. And this is what it looks like when somebody is completely broken. And they're throwing themselves on the casket. Now, the question that I had, what does it sound like? What does this type of mourning sound like? So let me tell you the backstory to this. There's going to be a short video. It's probably 45 seconds long. But I think you'll get the point. Here's a mom whose son was a young teenager. He was riding his bike down the road, and a car came over and hit him and kills him. And this is the reaction of the mom. This is what mourning sounds like.
just watching, watching it. The sound of her mourning is the word that Jesus is using here. That morning, when somebody has died and everything about you is so broken that you don't feel like you can get out of the bed, you don't feel like you can take another step because you're so broken. And many of you have been there. Some of you have been there so much that it is a great accomplishment as you're going through this morning to get a shower that day. Because you're mourning so much. You're so broken. And for some of you, it's about taking that step one day and then taking another step the next day. And two weeks later, taking two steps. But this is the type of mourning that Jesus is talking about. Now, Chris, when you say this, what does this mean? Why in the world are we mourning to begin with? How does this tie in to verse 3? Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. And then it says, blessed are those who mourn. Why in the world are we mourning? Meaning we are poor in spirit. It's because we have nothing to bring before God and we are complete sinners and we are completely in need of Him. We wake up every day knowing that I don't make a move unless he is allowing it. That I know the wretched man that I am in and of my flesh. And I know who I am. And I am in total need of his grace and his mercy every single day and his forgiveness. I live my life like this. But when a person understands this and they're coming to the grips of who they are and seeing in their relation to God, they are a sinner and therefore, this brings on the morning. Romans chapter 7, verse 18. He says, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Do you believe that? Hmm. Just take a look about who you really are. And by the way, who is he talking to? He's talking to the Pharisees. They're dressed up in all their garb. On the outside, they look righteous. They look religious. They look like they've got it going on. But on the inside, the Bible, Jesus calls them nothing but dead men bones. But on the outside, it looks like everything is great. And I want to tell you this, no matter what you look like and I look like on the outside, we know who we are in and of our flesh. Isaiah says that all of our righteousness are as a bloody, filthy rag. One of the videos that we had to watch at Vandalia, before the beginning of the year, was Bloodborne Pathogens. How many of you have watched Bloodborne Pathogen videos in your workplace? Yeah, all over. That's a great time, isn't it? Bloodborne Pathogen video, I thought about this. Is the, this is what it's talking about. It's talking about a bloody, filthy rag that has disease. And here's what he says. Your very best is a diseased, filled, bloody rag. So what do you have to offer to God? And all of a sudden, this person that is this beggar, all of a sudden they realize, I can't make it into heaven. I can't live out my life. I can't please God in anything I am because I have, my best is a bloody, disease-filled rag. Isaiah 6, 5 says, Woe is me, for I am ruined or unclean, because I am a man of unclean lips. Did you hear the lady? Did you hear what it sounded like? Let me tell you what that was the sound of. When you hear that in your life, when you come to the grips of the reality of your sin, that is revival. That, people, is revival. Revival. No, 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 Chris, you don't understand. Revival is people standing up and waving their arms and shouting and singing and running around the church. That is not revival. What you heard on that video, that is true revival. Every real revival that's ever taken place, that's all that is heard. It's the brokenness of our sin. Now, so let's tie both of these together. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, people that are poor in spirit, 
They realize that they are beggars. They have nothing to offer. You and I have nothing to offer God. We are truly, truly in need for everything. We're truly in need for our salvation. We're truly in need for Him. Every step we take, every day of our lives, we get up in need of Him. We go to bed in need of Him. I cannot take a step apart from Him. Everything that comes in and out of our lives, He is the one that is bringing in and is allowing. So, because we understand our condition, guess what we do? We're mourning. We mourn. We're sorrowing over our condition when God reveals the sin and who we really are. And we're crying out for mercy, for God's mercy, for God's grace. We are, verse 4, we mourn. That's what we do. So here's how they tie together. I am in total need of God. I am poor in spirit. And therefore, I begin to mourn. Guess what he says? Happy are those who are poor in spirit. Happy are those who are mourning. Does this sound like the world's definition of happiness? No. This is not the description at all. Because there's nothing external about this. It's all internal. And what I can tell you guys is this. The more you see who God really is, this is who you'll become. And the more you see who God really is, I'm going to go ahead and warn you. You're not going to like yourself much more. All of a sudden, the pride that you're holding on to and what you think you deserve and the entitlement that you believe that you're entitled to, whatever that is, it's going to begin to dissipate. The results of this mourning, what happens when we mourn? Now, here's what he says. They will be comforted. So what are you saying, Chris? Those who don't mourn, it's very simple, will not experience comfort. It's a sweet thing when you're going through mourning in your life and you're grieving as this woman, you know, at some point as you go through this grief, as Ecclesiastes says, yeah, there's mourning and there's grieving, but you know what I know to be true? There will be dancing again, right? There will be singing again. The word mourning here, why are these mornings ha- mourners happy is because the word mourning is, I mean, the word comforted means parakaleo. I love this word. It's a reference to the Holy Spirit. It's a reference to the word that somebody who is a beggar, then they will be, they will be fulfilled. Parakaleo means As I mourn and I go through this mourning, guess what? Pericleo, you have somebody that comes alongside, that helps you, that carries you, that walks you through this. Why? Because you can't do it alone. And he says that person who realizes that they're desperate need of God and they realize that they have nothing to offer God and they're broken over their sin... They're broken and they're miserable over their sin. Guess what we find? Pericaleo. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes alongside and they walk this journey now together. He literally is carrying them now. And now they've experienced comfort. Because you know what the awesome thing is? That when I stand before Jesus one day and he asks, why should I let you in? I'm only going to point to the Son. I have nothing That's comforting to me. My goodness and my best, if I had a bad day or I have a good day and all of a sudden I start judging this out and I put it on the scale from 1 to 10, I I didn't have a good day today, so I don't know if he he comes today. I don't know if I'll make it in. But tomorrow it may be better, but it may be worse. That's not how this works. It's a result of his finished work on the cross. So, there's some of you in here that have yet to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. And this is perfect for you because you are coming to the grips that if you want to come to Christ, number one, there has to be a call of the Holy Spirit. He has to be drawing you. Now, some of you have been drawn for some time and you keep rejecting the Holy Spirit. 
Some of you had eventually, after being drawn for some time, you, you did. You saw your need for God and you broke down and you began to mourn. But why is it? What does mourners look like? Why, what would cause them to mourn? Number one, what you cannot do for those who have never received Christ as their Savior, Hebrews 3, 8 says, do not harden your hearts. Do not harden your hearts. You can come to church all you want, but if you're hardening your heart, when God is moving upon your heart and he's calling your sin out and you're not mourning, you will not be comforted. Examine your cells. You see, what makes the church different is because we're not continually walking in sin. But the truth is, is examine your life and knowing this, that if you say, nope, this is what I'm going to hold on to. I'm telling you this, you're never going to experience full comfort. And the harder you fight and the more things you do, you're going to find yourself running from God. And more things are going to start happening into your life because God will discipline you to those he loves. The cause of a hard heart is this, is that that person just doesn't want to leave sin. What sin is it that you're holding on to that you don't want to get rid of, that you do not want to mourn over? What is it that you're holding on to? And God is the one that can tell you this, not the person beside you. It is the Holy Spirit that is revealing this to your heart. What sin is it? It could be your pornography. It could be uh, whatever it could be. What is it? What sin are you holding on to? It could be some of you are in despair thinking, you know, I'm beyond help. You know how many times I'm told this? Blows my mind. There's no help for me, preacher. And then they say this. If you only know the things, what? That I've done. You know what the good news is? There's nothing you haven't done, that they haven't done, that all of us haven't done. Because in the eyes of sin, uh, in, in the sin, in the eyes of the Savior, it's all what? It's all equal. He says, if you've broken one of these, you've broken them all. If you told one lie, you've broken all the Ten Commandments. That's the truth. And so I love talking to people and says, you know what? Guess what? I've done stuff as bad as you have. No, you haven't. Oh, yeah. Because I said I've murdered. What? I've lusted. I've committed adultery. What? Yeah. Whoever hates their brother in their heart, what has also committed murder, when Jesus looks at that, he says, I see it as equal. We judge people all the time by this person's in jail for this or this person's, I'm glad I'm not like them. You're just as faulty and just as failed. And so this person comes to this realization. And by the way, some people are just arrogant and they're thinking they're not that bad. And if you think you're not that bad and God's going to let you in because you're not that bad, think again, that's not Scripture. This is not a health and wealth gospel. You will not find that anywhere in the Scripture. Some people are procrastinating and they'll say this, but yeah, I want to wait for another day. I want to wait for another day. I just want to finish out having fun. And I want you to think about over and over since this 22-year-old is laying on his, his hospital bed and Ethan Bradshaw at 12 years old, Are you promised another day? Are you promised another day? Of any age? I was talking to somebody this week and they were talking about um, leaving and, and they were like, you know what? I don't know if I'll ever get this opportunity again. And I said, not only that, the younger people that are with you may never get this opportunity again because who's to say that they won't be passed? Age, death doesn't know an age, does it? These people that want to be comforted, they want, to, they want this forgiveness. How many of you want this forgiveness in your life? You want your conscience clear before this almighty God. In Psalms 28, 13, it says, One who conceals his wrongdoings will not prosper, but those who confess and abandon them will find compassion. For those who want this That's true happiness. It's time to relinquish 
your sin. And to mourn over your sin. To be broken over your sin. What about this? How about how many times do you ever pray, God, reveal the sin that's in my life? Because I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes we can get in our bubble and we think I'm doing okay and we think everything's good in my life. And the whole time, let me tell you what the Holy Spirit's really doing. He's doing this right here. You notice I'm not knocking very loud? Because that's exactly how he knocks, right? It's that still, small voice. And we're going about our daily life and we're living our life and we look, you know, yeah, I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. Psalms 26, 2, the writer says this, Examine me, O Lord, and try me and test my mind and test my heart. God, because I know that I can let pride build up inside of me and I can look around me and I can see what? I can miss really how I'm breaking your commands. Another writer in Psalms said, Search me, O God, and know my heart and try my thoughts. Examine yourselves. This almost sounds like a communion message on it. When's the last time that we've mourned over our sin? When's the last time that you've told a lie and you were able to get up and walk away from that lie and it never bothered you? When's the last time you could say a cuss word out loud and you walked away and you were kind of laughed and you thought that was okay? When's the last time you watched pornography and that was okay? When's the last time you fell before God and you got up and you walked away and you wasn't bothered a bit? There's a problem. That is not the church. That's not Christianity. There should be a brokenness about us when we fall. We should fall on our knees and be broken over our sins. There should be really, truly something going on with our conscience going, you lied, you stole, you did this, you cheated, whatever it is. There should be a brokenness about us. Where is the brokenness in the church today? Why is it that people can do whatever they feel like and there's no brokenness, there's no mourning? So how are you going to be comforted? In spite of your mourning, you'll know the comfort of true forgiveness. There's nothing like laying your head on your pillow at night with a clear conscience, is it? <laughs> Waking up in the morning with a clear conscience, going throughout the day and says, I did what was right. It wasn't easy, but I did what was right. How about for those, how many of you can lay your head on your pillow tonight knowing that you're bound for heaven? If, you've, if you're, this is the last day that you'll ever live on earth, that you can wake up tomorrow and the next time you open your eyes, you'll be in heaven. You know what? There's comfort in that. That's why a Christian funeral is different. Because this is not, I'll never see you again, that I'll be there in just a minute. Because this life is like a vapor, it's like a cloud that changes, it's gone, here and gone. I'll see you in just a minute. There's comfort in that. For those who have received Jesus Christ, then this is the claim. So he's either ridiculous or he is God. He says, I am Equality with God, the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh to the Father except through me. You, wanna, you want to experience this comfort? Then there's a brokenness, knowing that you're a beggar and that you mourn over your sin. I want to finish up with this. One of the reasons that pastors and leaders get out of the ministry is one of the things was discouragement and I've taught through some of the Corinthian church, and the Corinthian church was really a messed up place. They had a lot to learn. By the way, I, I think about this a lot. Paul uses illustration. He said, by the way, some of you that should be teaching are still being taught. You've been Christians for a long time. Let's go. Why are you still in the same condition you were? And Paul uses this illustration here. He said, what happens for those who don't move past the infancy of their Christian life? They're still receiving the milk of the word. So he uses this illustration. He says, I am afraid that when I come again, my God may humiliate me before you. 
And then this is why he says, and I'm going to mourn over those who have sinned in the past and not repented of their sexual immorality and decent behavior which they have practiced. He's talking about people within the local church and they're continually living in sin. And this is what Paul says, for those who are not repentant of their sin, God is going to humiliate me before you. Now, what does it mean? How is God going to humiliate Paul? This is what he means. Paul's going to walk in there and he's going to see that people aren't any different than they were after all the letters and after all the time and after all the preaching and after all the ministering. And he's going to say, Paul... You're just not a very good leader. Paul, you're not a good apostle. How many of you would argue the fact that Paul's not a good apostle, Paul's not a good leader, but he says this. He says, if I walk back into this church and I continue to see you in the same state that you were, I'm going to go ahead and tell you I must not be a good apostle. I must not be a good leader. I must not be a, a good preacher because guess what? He said, God is going to humiliate me. And you know what? I see leaders all the time, and I see that, that where people should be further along than they are. You've been Christians for 50 or 60 years, and you're still dealing with the same infancy things. They're still drinking the milk of the Word. And the question that you have is this, is that God is going to humiliate those leaders. Meaning, what's wrong with me? Why aren't we anything further than we are? You know why? It's because sin is not dealt with seriously in our lives. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to ask Carolyn to come, please. For some of you, you're really tired of battling the same sin over and over and over again. And I want to tell you, you have done everything in your power to try to fight it. You have laced your bootstraps up and you have tried to walk in there and fight it yourself. And I want to tell you what you've found is you've fallen on your face over and over and over again because why? You are truly a beggar. You're truly poor. And you realize this fight is not something that you can fight on your own and therefore you are coming to the place where you're tired of carrying this sin. And God has been breaking you He's been speaking to you over and over and over again. It's time that we become broken over what God is broken over, over what God hates. As she plays this morning, I'm going to pray for you. And at your seat right now, I want you to listen to the Holy Spirit. Say, God, search me. When I, I don't want to live each day in this same thing over and over and over again. No more. I don't want to live with anger and bitterness and resentment towards my neighbor. I don't want to. I don't want to be keep battling with the same sin. God, break me. Now, Father, I pray for each and every one of us in here as we come to the second part of this and you describe what true happiness is. It's a people who understand their position in you and they're poor. They're truly beggars. And then as a result of that understanding who we are, we begin to mourn. God, that we, we truly res experience revival in our life when we get our, on our hands and knees and we repent of the sin that we've been carrying with us. God, some people are tired of fighting in here and they've been fighting and fighting. They realize they... They're not the ones designed to fight this, but you're the ones that's going to fight it for them because they can't fight something that's spiritual in a fleshly realm. Lord, thank you for bringing us to this point where, Lord, you bring us to the point of mourning in order to be comforted. I pray that they, those will experience that in here today and in my life that we will experience this comfort as a result of our mourning. In Jesus' name, amen. Robbie.